This afternoon, it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you Stephen Mosher. Stephen is married to a most beautiful woman, Vera, and they have nine children. They live in Virginia, the United States of America. And Steve is the president of the Population Research Institute. I've had the honour of bringing Stephen here to New Zealand on several occasions for Family Life International, and Steve is involved with many of our other branches throughout the, um, the world. He's the author of several books. In fact, I understand that he's written 12, at least 12 and edited to that number of books. He's well published in very prestigious um, publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Linical Quarterly and many others. He is regarded as an international authority on debunking the population myth. Currently he is involved in appearing before Congress in the United States of America, pushing for, pushing for legislation to ban the selective sex uh, abortion which is very prevalent in the States. So he's very busy, he's very active, and is very determined that this sex selection in, of abortion in the United States should cease and cease immediately. So would you give a very warm welcome to Steve? Thank you. Thank you, Colleen, for that very gracious introduction. It's good to be back in New Zealand again. As Colleen mentioned, I've been here on a number of occasions and have always, have always regretted having to go back to the United States when it's time to leave on that, uh, the long plane ride. I'm a Catholic convert. I came into the church on a beautiful Easter day in 1991. That means that I'm exactly 21 years old in the faith. And my wife tells me that I'm now finally an adult. <laughs> but I still have to consult with her on certain subtleties and nuances of my faith, as I always have. You see, when, when God decided my, my soul was worth saving, he brought my wife, Vera, into my life. And I want to tell you a story uh, that involves Vera, as so much of my life has. It's a story about my first confession. Now, I don't know if the cradle Catholics among you remember their first confession, but I was 43 years old, and my first confession is burned into my memory. I was mere weeks away from receiving communion. I had longed to go up and receive communion for several years at that point. But before I could receive my Lord and my God in Holy Communion, I faced the hard prospect of penance. Before I could commune, I first had to confess. My instructor in the rite of Christian initiation and adults, uh, for adults, which is what we call it in the United States, I'm not sure what you call it here, the acronym in the States is RCIA, did not think that it would bother me perhaps as much as it did. But I will tell you, I will confess to you, that the thought of bearing my soul in front of a human audience was terrifying. I mean, growing up, I had never really been held accountable by anyone, not by my mother, not by my father. Aside from a few incidents of who broke the window, usually me, I had never been expected to own up to anything. So the thought of sitting down, kneeling in front of a man who, alter Christus though he may be, was sure to be disgusted by both the magnitude and quantity of my sins, just terrified me. And I was sure that following my confession, our good parish priest, Father O'Sullivan, who led St. Anthony's Parish in Southern California where we lived, would never be able to look me in the eye again. And, of course, my eyes would be permanently downcast when he was present. Vera, of course, my cradle Catholic wife, who is so understanding in so many ways, was more or less mystified by my hesitation. After all, she had gone to confession on a regular basis since she was a child. 
It was not that she thought nothing of it. It was more accurate to say that she thought everything of it. In fact, it was one of the organizing principles of her life. My sacramentally sanctified spouse had little idea of the, the problems that this prodigal son, the sins that this prodigal son had wallowed in. I'd been careful, of course, to tell her only a small part of my past life. Why should I populate her imagination with the dead images of my past sins? I was convinced, as always, by my own rationalizations, so I kept my secrets to myself. Finally, the Saturday morning appointed for my first confession arrived. As I staggered out the door under the weight of my sins, my wife called out to me cheerily, do you want me to pack you a lunch? <laughs> now, I can be remarkably dense. I was at one point in my life a college professor, and you know what that means. So I stopped, and I, I sort of half thought to myself, well, this must be some new nuance or subtlety or wrinkle of Catholic practice. Tell me why I need to take a lunch, I said. She delivered her punchline. Because you're going to be there all day. <laughs> well, if I'd been terrified before, now my knees were absolutely shaking. Now, I had dreaded encountering Father, o encountering Father O'Sullivan in the confessional. But God, in his mercy, had arranged for there to be not one, but two priests hearing confessions that day. There, of course, was Father O'Sullivan, my parish priest. But then there was also an elderly priest, gaunt with age by the name of Monsignor Clooney. And I knew at once that Monsignor Clooney was my man. <laughs> you see, for three long decades, he had been the chaplain at the nearby Chino Men's Prison, where he had heard the confessions of convicted murderers, rapists, and the like. I was sure that no evil I had committed would shock this hardened confessor. Besides, of course, after hearing my confession, he would disappear back into the walls of the Chino men's prison, and I could look Father O'Sullivan in the eye. So I sat down with Monsignor Clooney. Father O'Sullivan, unfortunately, had the only confessional, so we were sitting face to face. And I nervously told him that it was my first confession. I had some vague notion of going through all the commandments. And I thought, boy, if I go through all the subcategories and sub-subcategories of sin one at a time, I may need a lunch here. So I said to him this. I said, I've broken every commandment, Father. Uh, I have sinned before God and before man. I have so much on my conscience that I don't know even where to begin. And after a pause, this holy man said gently, then start by telling me the sin that weighs most heavily on your conscience. I spoke my great sin at once, and other sins followed. And at the end of my confession, he gave me absolution. Now, as he made the sign of the cross, I experienced a soaring sense of freedom. I didn't expect to experience this, but I realized that I had abased myself before God, that I had submitted myself to his judgment, I had sworn fealty to his laws, I had bound myself to obey them henceforth, and yet, Paradoxically, by binding myself to his laws, I was set free. God had broken the self-forged fetters of my prison and released me from the tiny dungeon of my ego. Now, of course, after confession, I, like most of us, would set about imprisoning myself again. But for the moment, I felt an incredible lightness of being and a deep sense of peace that, under the circumstances, made no sense at all to me. I found to my surprise that I was weeping. I, I'm, I'm not a weepy kind of guy. But even more surprising, I was not the least embarrassed to be doing so. Thanking Father, I, I left the church still weeping. I wept quietly, joyfully all the way home. Tears were still streaming down my face as I walked into the house. And of course, my beloved took one look at my tear-stained face and came running to embrace me. No jokes now. She said, oh, honey, was it that bad? <laughs> Her face a picture of sympathy. I shook my head and grinned through my tears and said, no, it was that good. Now, my road to the confessional 
my road to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church led, oddly enough, through China. And I'm going to tell you now how I found God in China in an odd sort of way. Back in the late 1970s, because I was the first American social scientist allowed to go into China and do research. It was March of 1979. China had been terra incognita for Americans for about 30 years since the coming to power of the Chinese Communist Party in 1949. I was then finishing up a PhD at Stanford University. I was teaching at the University of California at Berkeley, anthropology. And I was delighted to be on the ground floor of, of, uh, of, of our entry into China. I had no idea what I would find there, but I had been taught by my other colleagues at Stanford University that, that China had made great strides uh, economically, that uh, Mao Zedong had created a new socialist man, a new socialist woman, and that things were all pretty good in this socialist paradise. Well, when I got there in the village, I found out that most of what I had taught was not true. But the one thing that brought home to me uh, the tyranny of China was the one-child policy, because it was when I was living in China that year that the one-child policy began in China. It was that year that the government of China began to dictate to the Chinese people how many children they could have and began to order the arrest of women who were pregnant outside the state plan. In fact, in my village, the village I was living in, there were several dozen women who were arrested for the crime, the crime, mind you, of being pregnant without permission. These women were five months pregnant, seven months pregnant, some were even nine months pregnant, just days away from giving birth. I was surprised by this, and I went with them to see what would happen to them now that they had been arrested. They were taken to a government detention center, and they were told they could not leave. They were, they were under arrest, of course. And there they were subjected to morning to night study sessions led by senior Communist Party officials, all male, who told them that they had no choice but to have an abortion, who told them that their babies were illegal and they would not be allowed to live, and who even said to the women in the, in the lockup who were nine months pregnant just days away from giving birth, you should not think that we're going to allow you to give birth to the babies that you're carrying, because should you go into labor, we will simply take you to the local medical clinic and you will go home alone. This was a threat of what? It was a threat of infanticide. It was a threat that was actually carried out. I also went with these women as they were taken one by one, crying and sad, to the local clinic. As soon as they arrived, they were given a lethal injection into their wombs, an injection of a poison that was intended to cause the death of their unborn child. The poison took about 24 hours to work. And at the end of that process, their baby would be dead, and in most cases, they would be in labor and would then deliver the day, a day or two later a dead child. But in some cases, although the poison worked to kill the unborn child, contractions did not follow. And in those cases, the doctors would perform a cesarean section abortion. I was present when cesarean section abortions were performed on these women. I was in the operating room as the incisions were made and dead babies were being removed from the bodies of their broken mothers. Now, I have to tell you that I had up to that point entirely avoided thinking about the abortion question. I mean, we were taught uh, that this was a woman's issue, 
and was therefore not a fit subject for men to think about anyway. Now, witnessing uh, an abortion myself, I came to see, I came to see face to face what actually happened during that procedure. Because it was clear to me that what resulted from an abortion was a dead baby, a tiny son of Adam, who despite being smaller and weaker than the rest of us was fully human. And what also happened during an abortion was the physical and emotional wounding of the mother. And I became, at that moment, pro-life. The second thing that happened to me, witnessing the terrible horror of the one-child policy. And remember, I had seen forced abortions. I was also a witness to forced sterilizations. I was aware of cases of infanticide, forced contraception of women. I was witness to a program where the state basically took control of all the reproductive systems in the country and was dictating when they could be used to produce children. And so I began to rethink the question of overpopulation. Now I'll talk about this tomorrow, what I now call the myth of overpopulation. But at the time, you know, I had gone to China thinking that, well, maybe China's problem was that there were too many people. I left China convinced that China's problem was too much government, too tyrannical a government, too brutal a government. But another thing happened while I was in that operating room, witnessing the death of children. The third thing that happened was this. I realized for the first time in my life, I believe, that positive evil really existed. Now, this may seem strange to those of you who accept the existence of good and evil as givens, but you must remember that I came from Stanford University. I had been educated at one of the high temples of secular humanism. And in those high temples of secular humanism, people do not believe. Most of the faculty do not believe in the existence of good and evil. They believe that everything is shades of gray. They believe that good and evil are merely cultural constructs. They believe that there are no fixed horizons or compass points, only lighter and darker shades of gray. They're moral relativists. They're situational ethicists. They believe that what may be right in one situation may be wrong in another and vice versa. And here I was presented with an absolute evil that I could not rationalize away. The killing of a full-term healthy infant almost at birth. The killing of a tiny son of Adam. It was clear to me that this was an evil. And there, was only, there were only two things that I could do in response to this evil. The discovery that there was evil loose in the world was a great shock to me. You know, it was as if I had been walking through this pleasant dreamscape and opened my eyes to find that I was waist deep in a cesspool. How could God, I ask myself, if he is God, that is, if he's all good and all knowing and all powerful, permit such wickedness? So I had the choice. I could either allow the existence of evil to convince me that there was no God because how could he permit such evil to exist? Or I could allow the existence of evil to convince myself, as G.K. Chesterton said, that God does exist, but there is a breach between he and us that much must be crossed. If God didn't exist, I realized that the universe was mad, that nothing made any sense, and that we might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I did not want to live in an insane asylum. I rejected that possibility. I began to seek the good. And if you seek the good, you will be led inevitably to God. So that was how I began to find God in China. That was the beginning of my spiritual journey. When I returned in 1983 to the United States, I was already what I would describe to others as a pro-life agnostic. By this I meant that while I was emphatically against abortion, and sort of vaguely believed in a supreme being. 
he and I had still not established a regular channel of communication. Several things happened then, by God's grace, to bring me closer to him. The first thing that happened was I received a call from a Catholic priest by the name of Father Paul Marx. Now, I don't know if any of you recognize the name. Many of you over the years probably, if, if you've been attending the Eucharistic Conference or have been associated with Family Life International, you will recognize the name. He was a great pro-lifer. He passed away in the odor of sanctity a year and a half ago. But he called me out of the blue. I, I must admit, I was a little nervous to be talking to a Catholic priest. I'd never talked to a Catholic priest before. I'd been taught at Stanford University to keep my distance from people like that. And he invited me to speak at a conference. He said, I'm holding a pro-life conference in, in Washington, D.C., and I'd like you to come and give your testimony on what you saw in China, the forced abortions and forced sterilizations. Now, I wasn't at all sure that I wanted to associate with pro-lifers either, because I had also been taught at Stanford to keep my distance from you people. But no one else was listening. And let me tell you what I mean when I say no one else was listening. I left China thinking, I have evidence of women being forced to have abortions uh, throughout pregnancy. I have evidence of infanticide. I have photographs. I have documents. Uh, I have the goods on this barbaric policy. And surely I thought to myself, being partially still in a, in a, in a, um, a pro-choice stupor, Surely I thought to myself that, that, that some of the feminist organizations in the United States would be just as appalled at this as I was, and they would oppose it because, after all, they claimed to be pro-choice, and women in China were being denied a choice. So I went to the National Organization of Women, which is the paramount radical feminist organization in the United States, and I met with its senior leaders. And I presented them with evidence of forced abortions and sterilizations. I showed them pictures. And when I had finished, the head of the national organization looked at me and said something that will stay with me forever. She said, I'm personally opposed to forced abortion, but after all, China does have a population problem and they would do nothing. And that was that. I was dismissed from their presence. And they have to date never spoken out against the fact that hundreds of millions of Chinese women have been forced under duress to undergo abortions. They're not pro-choice, you see. When push comes to shove, they're pro-abortion. The only choice they want women to make is a choice for death, not a choice for life. They're unsympathetic to women trying to protect their unborn children, even from uh, forced abortions in China. So having had that experience, I let Father Marx know that I would be happy to come and speak at his conference. He said, fine, Steve, we'd like to have you. We can't afford to pay you. Pro-lifers are generally poor. But you can bring some of your books and, and maybe you'll sell a few. So I went to talk to them and, and, and this was another part of my conversion because I found myself at this conference in the middle of 5,000 or so people who were bright and cheerful and well-balanced and loving and kind and by the end of the conference, I had really begun to want to be like them. I, had want, I wanted to have what they had. And of course, what they had was, for the most part, membership in the Catholic Church. And I contrasted them, these well-balanced, loving, kind, and generous pro-lifers who were engaged in a struggle that they could never hope to benefit from in this world, speaking out for the voiceless. I compared and contrasted them with the rather bizarre personalities I had encountered in academe. People who are self-absorbed, people who are grasping at honors and recognition, big brain but small-minded. People who worshiped their own intelligence or people who worshiped a random dance of atoms. They were materialists denying anything in the spiritual realm. 
And I'll tell you what, the pro-lifers came out well ahead in that comparison. I began to want to be like them. And I began to be in regular communication with Father Marx, who sent me my first catechism. The second thing that happened was around that time, I stumbled upon the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, which for me personally was something akin to finding the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because just as the Dead Sea Scrolls demonstrated the authenticity of the scriptures, so did the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas teach me the validity of reasoning one's way to the truth, the truth which is God. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And it was on the wing of reason that I began to read my way into the Catholic faith. Because here was a philosophical edifice that not only encompassed all of creation, but also reached up to the very heavens that answered the big questions, the questions that academics at Stanford and Harvard and elsewhere shy away from. What is man? What is God? What is the state? What is the relationship between the three? So Thomas Aquinas was, was another part of the road that I traveled, who revealed to me the possibility that, that God spoke to man through his reason as well as through his faith, and that one could therefore read and think and study one's way into the Catholic Church, which I proceeded to do. The third person that played an enormous role in helping me to win my salvation, of course, was my wife, Vera. You know, we were married for a number of years before I was able to enter the church. But she took to heart St. Paul's admonition that the sanctified spouse should sanctify the unsanctified one. And she was everything that love should be. She was patient, she was kind, she was selfless and self-giving, and necessarily given my character, she was long-suffering. I believe that she intuitively understood in those early days that preaching at me would be counterproductive, so she did something even more powerful. She prayed for me. Of course, I didn't realize all those prayers were floating heavenward. And I probably in the early days would have objected somewhat if I had known, but of course she had the good sense not to tell me. <laughs> then came the day we were walking across the plaza in front of the old Spanish mission church in California in a city called San Luis Obispo, a mission that was built in 1780 or so. And suddenly the bells on the tower began to ring, summoning one and all to mass. It turned out the bells were pealing for me as well because Vera suggested in that gentle, loving way of hers that we go to services together. And so I agreed to attend my first mass. I, uh, I sort of went in like a visiting anthropologist who was there to observe an ancient religious rite. And I felt myself drawn in and uplifted by the liturgy of the word. And the liturgy of the Eucharist created in me an eagerness, which I was actually unable to satisfy for several years for communion with Christ. The final blessing came too soon. It was as if a song that I had once sung but long forgotten had found its way back to my lips, or a truth that I had known but had forgotten had made its way back into my consciousness. I began attending Mass with Vera on a regular basis, and it began to be very difficult to watch her go up week after week for communion while I remain sitting in the pew, communionless. Now, as I began to learn more about the Catholic faith, no doctrine touched me more deeply than the communion of saints. You know, the idea that we here on earth can be aided in our pilgrimage by those who have gone before links our world to the next in a marvelous, and positive symmetry. And it seemed particularly applicable to my circumstances because remember, the little children, the unborn babies whose deaths I had witnessed in China. And I thought of the great cloud of witnesses that St. Paul speaks of in Hebrews. And when I thought of the great cloud of witnesses, I thought mostly of those Chinese babies who had died in my presence. And I thought of how I had spoken out on behalf of those millions of innocent victims 
and China's one-child policy. By that point, I'd written books about it, I'd written articles about it, I'd done interviews about it, I'd given congressional testimony about it, I'd spoken at Father Marx's conferences and other conferences. Not to be outdone in generosity. I believed, when I heard about the communion of saints, that this vast multitude of heavenly intercessors had implored the Father on my behalf for a decade, begging before the throne of God for my conversion, for the grace of my conversion. So I came to believe. I had interceded for them in a very weak human way, while they, I became convinced, had interceded for me in a very powerful supernatural way. So I was by that point eager, eager to cross the Tiber. On Easter Sunday, 1991, I came into full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. It was a glorious spring day. But there was no less glory in the tabernacle of my heart because I received the great grace of Holy Communion with our Lord for the first time. But I was soon to learn that one never receives great graces without a compensating cross. The economy of salvation cannot long run at a deficit. The name of this particular cross was Andrew Christian Mosier, our fifth child, who was born on April 8, 1991, eight days after I entered the church. Now, all of our children up to that point had been instruments used by God for our purification and sanctification. You know, uh, they, our children provide us with opportunities to practice the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. Babies come into the world hungry and we feed them. They come into the world naked and we clothe them. Uh, my children had come into the world thirsty and Vera, gave them drink. All these things that we're instructed to do by our Lord for the least of these our brothers and sisters, Vera and I did for our own children as most people who are married and have children do. Our children of course also led us to practice the spiritual works of mercy, including praying for the sick, as any parent of an ill child can testify. But Andrew would teach us the most important lessons of all. You see, all of our children have been born by cesarean section and Andrew was no exception. He was delivered so that Vera could avoid labor which would have been dangerous for her. He was delivered a couple weeks early. But he came into the world at seven and a half pounds. Our pediatrician gave him a quick examination, pronounced him healthy, and then disappeared. After which Andrew decided to stop breathing. It turned out that he had a combination of symptoms. His lungs weren't functioning, uh, his, his blood wasn't getting any oxygen, and he was suffocating to death. They put an oxygen mask on him, didn't work. They put intubated him, put pure oxygen in his lungs, it didn't work. And so they put him on a heart-lung machine. They cut open his little neck and inserted a tube, a cannula, down through his carotid artery into his heart and through his jugular vein to take out the venous blood, oxygenate it through a membrane, and then pump it back in. This was a new procedure at the time and a dangerous procedure. It was a procedure that could only be used on newborn children and could only be used for about 10 days. The chief risk of this procedure, of course, was because you were doing so much with the blood that you would damage blood cells which would then clot and would cause cerebral hemorrhages or heart attacks. And so they had to put the babies who went through this procedure on heavy doses of a blood thinner called heparin. But of course, that carried with it other risks. Because on heparin, you run the risk of he internal hemorrhaging or of hemorrhaging in your brain. So we were told that Andrew only had 10 days to recover. Or perhaps I thought he only had 10 days to live. Now, my wife and I began praying frantically for Andrew's recovery. We prayed separately at that point. We had never, up to that point, prayed together. But Andrew's survival drew us together. In a common cause, we overcame our initial awkwardness in praying in each other's presence, and we were soon reciting rosary after rosary after rosary, uh, begging God to heal Andrew. So this was Andrew's first lesson. Just by being there and just by needing our prayers, he taught us to pray. Yet the days kept going by with no improvement. The clock kept ticking. 
and soon it would take its last. And Andrew would be taken off the heart-lung machine, and if his lungs hadn't improved by that point, he would surely die. The days passed. Finally, a week had passed, the longest week of my life. I was making three trips a day down to the Children's Hospital of Orange County in Southern California, spending an hour each way on the road to visit my son and pray for him. I was utterly exhausted. My wife was still in the hospital from the cesarean section. I was physically, mentally, and emotionally wrung out. I had at the same time been reading the medical literature, trying to figure out how I could help Andrew. The answer was there was nothing I could do. And I finally reached a point of absolute helplessness. I, his father, I, the man who was supposed to be his protector, I, the man who was supposed to, to guard him from the dangers of the world, could do nothing for him. And finally came the hour that I had to put my trust completely in God. And I did the same thing in my mind that Abraham did with his son Isaac. I took Andrew, my little son, lying in his bed of pain, having wires and tubes going where no baby should have wires and tubes, up to the top of Mount Moriah. And I laid my innocent son down on the stone altar. And I was prepared to sacrifice his life for the love of God. And standing by his bed, I prayed the prayer that I had been unwilling to pray up to that point. I said to God, he was yours before he was mine. And if you want to take him, I give him freely back to you. I cannot tell you what it took me to say those words. It was an admission that I was powerless to protect my son. It was an admission of utter helplessness and dependence upon God. And here was the other lesson that Andrew taught us just by being there. It was a lesson of total submission to God's holy will. Of course, we know that God is never outdone in generosity. And he was not outdone in this circumstance. Because almost from the moment that I prayed that prayer, Andrew began getting better. The next time I asked the nurse, she said, well, we're turning down the heart-lung machine because his lungs are beginning to work. Andrew's turnaround when it came, you might say, was remarkable. But that would be an understatement. It was miraculous. I gave my son to God when he was sick and dying, and God, in his mercy, gave him back to me. The children continued to come, and I want to tell you the story now of Thomas Aquinas Mosier because this is another miracle story. I think the, the parents of uh, uh, parents who have a large family uh, are, are frequently on their knees before God and that God helps him in many different ways. With our son Thomas Aquinas, my wife was placenta previa. This means that when Thomas was very small, no larger than the head of a pin, he did something very foolish. Instead of implanting in the top part of Vera's uterus, he implanted himself near the bottom, near the opening of the cervix. And as his placenta grew, it grew to cover the opening of the cervix. That's what placenta previa is. And placenta previa is characterized by frequent hemorrhaging. A woman can bleed to death when she's placenta previa because the placenta will tear away from the wall of the uterus, there will be bleeding, the bleeding will irritate the uterus, there will be contractions, the contractions will cause more tearing, and ultimately the baby can be spontaneously miscarried and, and the mother can suffer severe hemorrhaging. Vera's hemorrhaging began at 26 weeks. We woke up in the middle of the night, there was blood all over the bed, I took her to the local hospital, they brought her in, got her stabilized with the right doses of medication, and after a few days, she was able to come home. The process repeated itself the next week, and the week after that, and the week after that. Finally, she was 33 and a half weeks pregnant. We were hoping that she was far enough along so that Thomas's lungs would be mature and he could be safely delivered by cesarean section, but the test came back negative. She would have to try to carry him a couple more weeks. 
I was scheduled to go to the state of Michigan and speak when she had her final and most violent hemorrhage. We went to the hospital. They were able to get her stabilized, and, and I said, honey, I'm not going to go to Michigan. I'm going to stay here in California with you. I can't leave your bedside at this point. She said, no, no, the, 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 the bleeding has slowed down. I'm getting good care here. I'll be fine. You just go and, and come back as soon as you can. You know, don't disappoint the people in Michigan. So I got on the last flight I could out of Southern California, landed in, in Flint, Michigan, just in time to take a taxi to the banquet that I was speaking at. I got to the banquet as everyone had finished eating, and I was being introduced. I literally walked in the room as they were introducing me. And for the next 40 minutes, I talked to them about population control programs and the evil of China's one-child policy. And when I finished, I said, I have a special request for all of you tonight. I told them that my wife was in the hospital, that she was placenta previa, that she had just suffered a severe hemorrhage, and that it was not yet time for my son Thomas Aquinas to come into the world. And I asked them to pray for her healing. And a good pastor stood up and led 500 pro-lifers in, in five minutes of heartfelt prayer for my wife. As soon as that was over, I went to my hotel room. I picked up the phone and I called my wife in the hospital. And I said, how are you doing, honey? She said, well, up to a few minutes ago, I wasn't doing very well. I was, in, I was bleeding heavily, and the doctor said if it continued for a little while longer, the loss of blood would be so severe they would have no choice but to do a cesarean section, even though Thomas isn't ready to be born. But the bleeding has stopped. The bleeding has stopped. The contractions have stopped. And not only that, we know that was a healing because when she was released from the hospital and came home, she carried that baby for the next five and a half weeks. She carried Thomas for the next five and a half weeks until he was 38 weeks without having a single hemorrhage, without losing a single drop of blood or having, having contractions. So it, it was a healing. His lungs were mature when he was born and, and he's a, a healthy, um, a healthy um, 17 year old today. So obviously these stories do not mark the end of my spiritual journey, nor really even the beginning of the end. There were more children to come after Thomas. There was Luke, Michael, Guadalupe, Mosier. Why would you call your son, give him the middle name of Guadalupe? Well, he was born on December 12th by scheduled cesarean section. That is, of course, the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, when he was younger, he used to introduce himself as Luke Michael Mosier, skipping the Guadalupe, but now he's become rather proud of it. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, at, at 14, he's six feet tall and 220 pounds, I think, <laughs> helps in that regard because no one is going to laugh at him in the eighth grade. And then, of course, there was Kiara, Faith, and Mosier, whom we got by faith in, in God through the intercession of good Saint Anne, which is why she's called Kiara, Faith, and Mosier. You see, my wife came to me several years ago and said, we've had the last two children are boys. She said, I don't want to end on a boy. <laughs> Those of you who have multiple sons will understand her sentiment. She said, I, I want to have another little girl. Well, by that time, we were both older. Of course, most of the aging was done by me, not by her. Um, she'll always be 21 in my eyes. But she came, she came to me and said, let's pray that we're blessed with another child. Well, we went through uh, hormone therapy, which is licit because she was premenopausal and needed a little help within the progesterone estrogen department. That didn't work, and a couple of years went by. 
And I finally said, you know, I'm speaking at a conference in Toronto, Canada. Why don't we, after the conference, go up to St. Anne de Beaupre, the great cathedral, the great basilica built to good St. Anne in Quebec City, Quebec Province, Canada. After all, good St. Anne had an infertility problem. She had one child, the Blessed Mother, late in life. So after the conference, we drove up to that great basilica, went through a mass in French, of which I understood mostly the amens. And then we went down, and then we went down, and, and we were looking for the, the, the tabernacle. We were looking for the Blessed Sacrament because it wasn't reserved behind the altar. It wasn't in the crypt church in the, in the basement either. And then we noticed there was a Sacred Heart Chapel. And Vera went up to the door of the Sacred Heart Chapel and tried to open it. But it turned out that the door was locked. And then she turned to me and said, are there any fresh flowers here in the basilica? And I said, no, it's March in northern Canada. There won't be fresh flowers for months yet. She said, did anyone walk by wearing perfume? And I said, no, there's no one else here but us. The elderly Frenchman who had been at the mass had, had already departed. And then she said, no more. And we gathered up the children, and, and uh, after getting... Uh, some holy water and a couple of other things from the gift store, we got in our 15-passenger van and headed back south. And my wife was, was, uh, was very quiet for about a half an hour, unusually quiet. And I finally turned to her and said, you know, I, I know something happened back there. Why don't you tell me what it was? And she said, well, you know, I had wanted to, 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 to spend some time in adoration in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, and I was so disappointed when I found the door locked. And then I smelled a heavenly scent, and I heard the words, I'm here. And I looked at her and said, do you know what this means? And she looked at me and said, what? And I said, this means that our prayer has been answered. And we went back to Virginia, and we went to the drugstore and got one of those pregnancy test that you can buy over the counter now, and it came back positive. And nine, nine months later, Kiara was born, and now you know the source of her middle name because we got her by faith in God through the intercession of good Saint Anne. And of course, we also have a devotion to Saint Clara Santa Chiara, and took her to Assisi when she was nine months old to dedicate her to her name saint. So the children have played a great role in my conversion along with my wife, of course. And I'm no longer a Catholic simply because I reasoned my way with the help of God's ability to reason that he gifted us with. I'm a Catholic because of miracles that have occurred in my, lives and, uh, my life and the lives of others. Other things have happened since that I don't have time to share with you. But I will share with you my favorite, my favorite stanza from the poems of William Blake. And the great English poet wrote, I give you the end of a golden string, only roll it into a ball, and it will take you to heaven's gate set in Jerusalem's wall. And the golden string, of course, is the grace of God, the grace that we need for our ongoing conversion. And he uses, of course, different instruments, in my case the instrument of Father Marks, of all the pro-lifers that I met, of St. Thomas Aquinas speaking to me through his works across the centuries, of my loving wife and our children, and the belief in the communion of saints and the help that we're getting through those who've gone before us. So I journey on, I've got a firm grasp on the golden string, and I'm determined to keep rolling it up into a ball until I arrive safely at heaven's gate, set in the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem, home at last. Thank you.